Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, October 14th. I'm Katie Balls, The Spectator's Deputy Political Editor. On this week's show, how did the government mishandle COVID? Fraser Nelson and James Forsyth will join us to discuss. A new report says Boris and his team failed to challenge scientific guidance. Could this be the beginning of an American-style distrust or authority? Douglas Murray will be on the show. Fewer and fewer people in developed countries are choosing to have children, with an increasing number blaming climate dread, a fear that the world won't be safe to start a family in. Are they wrong? We'll speak to the journalist Maddie Kearns and the researcher Britt Ray. Philosophy professor Kathleen Stock has been hanged by students and activists because of her views on gender. Do academics still have freedom of speech? Matthew Goodwin, the writer and Kent University professor, says no, and he'll be on with Robert Ford from the University of Manchester, who takes a slightly different view. And finally, the recently leaked Pandora Papers showed the finances of the rich and famous, among them one of Vladimir Putin's alleged mistresses, who is supposed to have had a child with him. Why is the Russian leader so secretive about his private life? I'll be joined by Owen Matthews to try and answer that question. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the red subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode again. And why not also subscribe to The Spectator magazine while you're at it? You can get 12 weeks of the magazine and a free £20 Amazon voucher for just £12. To take up the deal, just go to www.spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. First up. Two Conservative-led committees have released a report on the government's COVID response. They say the government relied too heavily on scientists and it was too late in locking down the country. Who was in the firing line and has the report missed something? I'm joined now by Fraser Nelson and James Forsyth. Fraser, let's start with you. What did you make of the report? I was struck by what it didn't say. I mean, the biggest question of the last 18 months is whether lockdowns worked or not. At the beginning, nobody had the faintest idea. It's never been used before in pandemic control. Now lockdowns have been implemented by countries right around the world. We've got so many studies. Right now, we've got something like two and a half thousand studies coming out every week into COVID lockdown and the various effects. So we know there's now a wealth of data that we can look at. And the government's, sorry, the, the parliamentary committee didn't really look at this data. Now, what jumps out at me is the, uh, the behaviour of people before lockdown. The question, the modelling assumed that unless the governments told people to go and stay at home, they wouldn't, that life would continue as before. In fact, we now know, because right now everybody carries around a mobile phone with them, and Google can track people going to work, people going to the park, people going to the shops. So the Google mobility data is incredibly rich, incredibly detailed, and available for cities and countries around the world. Now, that data shows us that by the time the lockdown procedures were implemented, there were something like 60% reduction in the number of people going to work. It didn't really get much more of a reduction after that. So people had already seen what was happening and changed their behaviour accordingly. Now, the International Monetary Fund has done a study of similar surveys right around the world, and it's found that for democracies, for um, advanced economies, which are information rich, where people can follow the news on their smartphones, then every time the infection levels were going up, people were slightly more inclined to stay at home and reduce their mobility. So by using kind of common sense, by listening to the advice, not the instructions, but the advice of government, you were able to come to a common sense solution over here. Um, we didn't do that over here, of course. We went for lockdown, we went, we set the police after people walking their dogs, people going for drinks in the park together. But Sweden was the only country that didn't use the police. They went for a kind of voluntary response, and that worked. Sweden twice forced back COVID peaks for people staying at home voluntarily. Now, the data suggests that Britain could have done that too. We didn't necessarily need to adopt the Wuhan model and the rather authoritarian uh, regime that we ended up living in under lockdown to get the desired effects. So this is the most intriguing question. Now that we've got the data, now that we can see how people in advanced democracies respond to news of a worsening pandemic, if they do stay at home, if they do follow advice, do you really need to use lockdown? Do you really need to get the police involved? And do you really need to impose the collateral damage that lockdowns always entail? To me, this is the single most interesting question about COVID. And it's a question which I'm afraid to say 
the uh, select committee didn't get around to looking at, let alone answering. James, when it comes to Fraser's points, is there any thinking going on in government, at least on the answers to those questions? Or is it really a case of hopefully the worst of the pandemic is over, let's not think or talk about it? I think if you look at the government's uh, plan for the winter, a lot of it does rely on uh, the kind of things that Fraser was talking about. You know, just simply warning people that the situation is bad might lead to sufficient changes in behaviour to kind of bring the R rate back down again. So I, so I think the government is moving away from the kind of sledgehammer approach of, of lockdowns to, to, kind of, uh, to, to kind of subtler, more gradated policies, which is obviously easier to do now that uh, such a high proportion of the population have been vaccinated against COVID. I think one of the other things I was struck by in the report was it talks about the lack of data that the government had to assess the situation, which is true. But I'm still struck even now by the poor quality of the data coming out. I mean, I think it's remarkable that we don't have a real time sense, even 18 months into the pandemic, of how many people are actually dying each day because uh, deaths are not, uh, there's often quite a lag, especially at the weekends, which, um, in when deaths are reported or not. And I mean, there, this is a problem, which is when you are trying to make policy and the data, which is, uh, and the data is not up to date. I think, mean, I think mean, that is an issue, uh, and I think that will be a particular issue because, you know, according to the spectators, um, Philip Thomas model at the moment, you know, the R rate has now gone back above one, and so I think that you know that and the relatively slow pace of the booster program, I, I, I think there will be a few more debates about what kind of interventions are needed in, in the coming weeks. Fraser, when it comes to who emerges, you know, the worst or the best from the report, it really does feel as though there's enough blame to go around. Uh, Public Health England, scientists, ministers, none come out particularly well. There's a little praise from Matt Hancock on his testing target. Was there anyone who struck out to you reading that report as deserving of praise? I'm afraid to say not really, but that's the general rule with COVID. I don't think there's anybody in the whole world who handled COVID particularly well. The only question is how it caught everybody by surprise. Everybody made huge mistakes that were perhaps inevitable given how little information we had. And even now, it's way too early to say who has been a success in COVID and who hasn't, because we haven't seen the effects of lockdown yet. We still haven't seen the long-term effects on them closing the schools, on healthcare. We still don't know how this is going to end. Is Britain going to hit some kind of herd immunity through vaccination? That means COVID won't come back in the winter. Or is the recent revival in the COVID numbers um, seen on the Spectator Data Hub? We're now looking at 38,000 cases a day, up from 34,000. That's going in the wrong direction. Is that an indication that we're about to hit yet another wave in the winter? Now, the Philip Thomas model suggests not, but who knows? One thing you know about COVID is that it takes everybody by surprise. So I think, you know, maybe in four or five years' time, we might get a report that could say in a meaningful way who did well and who did badly. The truth is that everybody still now, to a very large extent, is just taking a leap in the dark. And it will be some time before we find out who, if anybody, has landed in daylight. James, one of the things I was struck by is almost how little commotion the report has caused. If you look in government, in number 10, uh, you would think in a way, if you, if you walked away, a report which is so damning, talks about the worst public health crisis in history for the UK, could at least uh, lead to talk of resignations. But there's nothing like that. Do you think um, when it comes to you know, uh, where there will be consequences, is there concern in 10 Downing Street over the eventual uh, inquiry? Is that a cause of concern? or not so much? I mean, the public inquiry where you see uh, people giving evidence almost certainly under oath, that, that will attract a lot of attention. But I suspect in terms of the politics, the, the, this, this inquiry is not going to report until after the next election. And so in some ways there is some distance. I also think one of the reasons why, um, I mean, you, you alluded to this in, 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 in a piece you wrote this week, Katie, one of the reasons why the report didn't cause that much commotion is what it said essentially reflected the kind of current Westminster consensus, which was the UK should have locked down um, uh, earlier than it did. Uh, it should have been more aware that uh, the plan should have been for um, uh, a kind of SARS-style virus rather than purely planning for an influenza pandemic. Uh, but the government did get 
uh, vaccine procurement uh, in the first place right, that it was right to order all these doses in advance before the efficacy of these vaccines had, had, had been proved. So I think the report was, uh, and I think it's, it's worth noting that the, these two select committees came to a unanimous report because it, it essentially reflects the current consensus in thinking about how this uh, virus has been handled. Now, Fraser, looking ahead, uh, when it comes to what Boris Johnson and his ministers are concerned about in the coming months, we've heard about the effing crisis, energy, fuel and food. Where's COVID on this? Is it, you know, top five concern or does Boris Johnson feel as though he has bigger fish to fry? Well, rightly or wrongly, COVID really has dropped out of that top five. I've been struck how long I can go now without hearing COVID mentioned by the government ministers and other politicians that I, that I speak to. It's there is as a big what if, like what if there is a COVID plus flu combination this winter. But it's not as even as if COVID has gone away. I mean, right now there are still thousands of people in hospital with COVID. But we are now getting to the stage where we're like, we now regard it as a background noise, a background disease. It's up there. It's a killer in the same way as, as influenza. We're getting used to it in a way. Now, of course, that might change. We might get a new variant, as happened this time last year. All of these things are possible. But right now, I think the government is really getting quite worried about the, as, as you call it, Katie, the effing crisis, the energy, fuel and food. Boris Johnson was a bit rash in claiming ownership of this crisis, making out in last week's Tory conference. This was part of a, a cunning plan of his to put um, wages up. But having laid claim to it, he is going to have to own it if this crisis doesn't go away and if this crisis leads to shortages right up until Christmas with perhaps more serious side effects. I don't think anybody, again, this is a worldwide crisis, it's not just Britain, you can look at what's happening in America right now, um, it's very similar stories. But because of the way Boris Johnson's handled it, it's kind of on him now, in a way it wouldn't have been had he decided to take a different line at Tory party conference. So that's why I think that the shortages, rather than COVID, will, will be the government's number one sort of ghost of Christmas future panic right now. And James, just finally, another problem the government faces on the Northern Ireland Protocol. There have been efforts this week. Uh, David Frost gave a speech and the European Commission have been setting out potential measures to ease some of the problems with the current checks. Um, but yet, Dominic Cummings has popped up, as he has a tendency to do, and made things a little bit more difficult for the government. What's gone on there? Well, Dominic Cummings has sent a kind of series of tweets suggesting that uh, the UK government's plan, although... Um, Dominic Cummings says not, Boris Johnson not. Uh, he doesn't excuse Boris Johnson because Boris Johnson thought this plan was wrong, but he says but Boris Johnson didn't know what he'd signed uh, and so kind of wasn't in on this, was to uh, essentially to uh, to try and kind of get, get the deal done, including the Northern Ireland Protocol, and then basically once you'd signed the deal, try and change the protocol, try and fix it afterwards. And this has led to lots of accusations of bad faith. You've had uh, the Irish Deputy Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, who will obviously become the Taoiseach again under their coalition agreement, um, suggests that you know any country about to sign a free trade deal with Britain should be very wary because this is not necessarily a government that sticks to its word. I think in terms of what Seskovic has outlined, there is enough there for there to be a negotiation between the UK and the EU. Uh, I think the question then becomes whether there is enough trust, and trust is not a commodity in high supply when it comes to, um, uh, there's a supply shortage of trust, you might say, when it comes to UK-EU relations. Uh, if there's enough trust to set this thing up on a, on a, on a more sustainable, durable footing. Uh, I think there's going to be a particular row about the role of the ECJ. I, I think there are ways around that. I think, you know, you could look at, the, for example, the way that the Swiss um, deal with the EU handles the ECJ, or even the way that the UK, the broader UK-EU um, free trade agreement handles the ECJ question. So I think there are ways around this, but I think that, um, but I think we are, we are in for, uh, not immediately, but we will be in for over the coming months, some more Brexit drama about this, uh, some more uh, bad-tempered negotiations. Although I did think it was interesting that David Frost's speech, while sweeping in terms of what it wanted in terms of change to the protocol, was, um, by the standards of this government, relatively restrained in its language. Thanks, James. Thanks, Fraser. If the scientists got a lot wrong, are we in danger of seeing what's happened in America? 
of widespread mistrust of institutions like the police, the intelligence services, and of government more generally. Douglas Murray makes the case in his column this week and joins me now. Douglas, thanks for coming on. Um, when it comes to the report, ultimately the government have been accused of doing the wrong thing by listening to experts, but isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Uh, well, yes. I mean, obviously there's been uh, an extraordinary 18 months in which uh, all of us and the public have allowed uh, unimaginable, previously unimaginable infringements on our freedom, limitations on our freedom, um, all at the advice of experts. The government in Britain, as in countries around the world, has re repeatedly and routinely said, we're just listening uh, to the experts. And so whenever uh, those experts have a, a knock against their expertise, as it were, uh, I should say in the column, you know, a lot of other things happen. Uh, when, as this week with the MPs report, uh, you, you, you see the things again that we've seen so many times in the last 18 months of the scientific advice getting it wrong, of predictions, extrapolations being wildly wrong, it's not enough just to park that and think, well, that's a mistake. This, this has a follow-on effect, a set of follow-on effects that all of us are going to feel. And I mentioned in passing in the column, of course, I feel it myself. I, I tend to defer, as I think people ought to, uh, to experts in areas that I'm not expert in. Um, and uh, as I say, if I uh, go to a hospital when I break a bone, I don't look up online to see home remedies for bone, for bone breakage. And it's the same with pandemics. It's the same lots of things. But at the moment that actually that deference to expertise is shown to be much more questionable than we might like, a whole set of other doubts start to creep in. And that's really what the column's about. Yes, and you say in your column that actually one of the things that concerns you is if you look to the US, we could uh, end up going in a similar way. Now, you spent a lot of time in the United States and you're speaking now from there. Um, so, so what exactly do you mean by that? What do you see? Well, th there's something that is almost completely unremarked upon, very little understood about America that I think is absolutely astonishing. It's happened in the last few years, and it's this. The, um, the American right in particular... Um, has become something which is unrecognisable from even five years ago, in one sense in particular, which is its wild distrust of any and every institution. Uh, you know, uh, conservatism used to be um, intrinsically caught up with the idea of veneration of institutions. And as I say, even five years ago, the American right, uh, you could predict that, for instance, they would be um, very, very uh, reverent towards the military. Uh, they would uh, revere the intelligence agencies, CIA, FBI, NSA, and, and, and so on. Uh, they had uh, trust in other institutions, including the law, uh, the legal system, and much more. And we're now at a position in the States where for reasons which are fascinating and probably too lengthy to get into today, um, that has completely changed. So that the American right uh, now not just distrusts, but actually derides uh, the military chiefs. I mean, they, they still respect the, the, the soldiery. They still respect uh, the men and women in uh, uniform. But the top brass, you know, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, routinely ridiculed. Uh, on the evening news uh, programs uh, on uh, right-wing news and uh, conservative columnists lampoon these people. They, they mock them. Uh, it's the same uh, with the intelligence agencies, the NSA, the CIA. Uh, uh, these are now uh, institutions which the American right has profound doubt about, um, believes very often that there are conspiracies going on uh, involving them. Uh, uh, other examples, uh, the Inland Revenue, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, um, other, other wings of government, and then you get the final one, of course, which is wild distrust in the actual uh, act of voting and the way in which votes are added up. Now, as I say in the column, I mean, I think people should see this as a warning because the American right has not got to this position from nowhere. It's got there, among other things, because of the extraordinary politicization of its intelligence services and the military top brass. 
Don't forget the General Milley, uh, Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff, was uh, talking about and defending the teaching of critical race theory at West Point whilst Afghanistan fell apart. Uh, uh, the former head of the NSA and the CIA, Mike Hayden, uh, was in the summer tweeting that Trump voters are the same as the Taliban. Uh, we've seen uh, investigations, uh, we've seen uh, croc uh, conspiracies pouring out from previously respected entities. And of course, then we have the um, incredibly uh, uh, toxic issue of the judiciary and the actual act of counting votes. And I say this is a warning, should be seen as a warning by everybody outside America. You know, institutions don't just have, and experts don't just have um, respect because respect is always going to be offered to them. They have respect, re acquire respect and retain respect um, by respecting the public in turn, by being able to level with the public when they've got things wrong, by a certain degree of transparency, not a complete transparency, but a certain degree of transparency. Muck this up, politicize it, and you end up in this position, as I say, where conservative people in America overwhelmingly distrust all of the institutions that only a few years ago we would have called conservative in some way. And as you say, Douglas, a lot of this criticism in America comes from the right. So when you're looking to the UK, we've obviously touched on the official scientific advice, um, no doubts now about Public Health England, about scientific advisors. Are there any other institutions which you think uh, are ones where they potentially carry this risk um, if we look ahead to a few years' time? I mean, the BBC is clearly one where the government too uh, lands blows against it. So what institutions do you think are particularly vulnerable to this? in the UK? Yes, I, I think, by the way, the, the one that, that you missed from that list, but of course you and I know is very interesting, is government. Um, it, it, it almost goes without saying that people distrust government, or at least expect government uh, not to be entirely level with them on certain things. I mean, obviously people who don't vote for a particular government are going to be more suspicious. But even people who do vote, for instance, for the Conservative government in Britain, don't expect it itself and Boris Johnson at the head of it to be the crucible of all truth and honesty. You know, we've built in a certain amount of suspicion about politicians. It's the expertise behind that. Uh, as you say, principally the one I think is striking is, is the, the looming, if not already existing, loss of respect for the scientific advisors and for the idea of listening to the science, which has been one of the things we've been told about so much over the last 18 months. But you're right, there are many other institutions that come in behind that. BBC's a very good one. I think there have actually been efforts, uh, clearly there have been efforts in the last year and more uh, to try to make sure the BBC doesn't go the way that you could see it going, of, of completely losing the trust of, as it were, all sides in the political uh, uh, spectrum. And, and I suppose in a way, this is, this is, a, um, this is a call to, to, to shore up those institutions that do still have residual public trust. Uh, I mean, everybody has their critiques of an institution like the BBC, uh, I, 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 am, I among many others. But actually what you see, if you, if, if you see the scenario in America where, for instance, I mean, the left has uh, just as much distrust of institutions. It's just that, you know, I mean, fortunately for them, their guy got in last year, you know, so they sort of dampened it down. The left in America, remember, spent uh, the previous four years uh, pretending uh, that the 2016 election had been stolen by a few Russian bots. So, so they actually don't believe in election integrity particularly uh, either. Um, but as I say, w when your guy's in, in power, it's a bit easier to gloss over some of this stuff because temporarily, broken or not, the system's sort of worked for you. Uh, but all, all of this is a warning that, that institutions, experts and others have to be incredibly wary about politicising themselves and, and being politicised. Uh, we have seen in Britain extraordinary cases of this in the past. But I would say, by and large, we remain in slightly better health. Um, we obviously, in the 2000s, had profound uh, questions and doubts for many people about the security services and MI5 and MI6, and particularly intelligence failures. Um, I would have said they've recovered from that, but there's a lesson in that as well, which is 
not to enter the political arena if you can, and you should simply always, if you can, resist it. The problem in America has been non-political people, or people at least who should be above politics, immersing themselves in the day-to-day -day fight of politics. I gave the example of Mike Hayden, there are pl plenty of others. I mean, General Milley also I mentioned earlier. It, it, the importance of riding above that is that if you don't, you exacerbate this sense of politicization of the institutions, which itself leads to this w incredible, and I have to say justifiable, mistrust and distrust in the institutions. Um, I think we've avoided that in Britain, but it is a warning. It should be a warning. Uh, uh, because, uh, as I say in my column, it, to understand the situation that America is in, in at the moment, you, you would have to imagine a conservative movement in the UK that disliked and distrusted and mocked the chiefs of the military, uh, and all of this for justifiable reasons, as I say, uh, which loathed MI5, hated MI6, uh, um, believed the GCHQ routinely uh, leaks against journalists, for instance, uh, doesn't believe that the court system is fair, and also believes that we don't have election integrity. And you would say in the British context, if we listed off those things, well, what's conservative exactly about anybody who thinks that, that's a sort of proto-revolutionary uh, set of views. But that is the situation in the US, and I think it is a warning to people in Britain and elsewhere. Thank you, Douglas. It's a great pleasure. This week's cover story, Baby Doomers, looks at why more and more people are choosing not to start a family because of climate dread. They argue that bringing a child into the world not only could make the situation worse, but there might not be so much for the child to even enjoy by the time they get to adulthood. Are their fears unfounded? The journalist Maddie Kern says so in her cover piece for this week's magazine. She joins me now along with Britt Ray, the author, broadcaster and researcher from Stanford University. Maddie Britt, thanks for coming on. Maddie, first, can you explain your argument? Yeah, so it's a trend that we've seen uh, for some time now, certainly in celebrity culture. People like Meghan and Harry spoke about limiting their family size on the basis of climate change. Now we have some polls that are showing that this is more common than just a, a sort of fringe phenomenon. Um, it seems to be two main reasons why people are, are making this decision. The first is the argument that children themselves contribute and worsen the climate crisis. And the second argument is that it would not be fair to children to bring them into a, uh, a planet that is in such bad condition. Britt, you've researched the impact of climate change and climate change warnings on mental health. What, what have you found? The climate crisis has an enormous mental health burden that runs a large spectrum. So if we're talking about being caught up in floods and fires or hurricanes or heat waves, for example, we have tons of evidence to show that that can uh, result in creating mental health disorders or exacerbating mental health disorders, whether we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression. There's um, a huge impact on community that can uh, disintegrate resilience um, and essentially cause sense of chronic uh, loneliness, alienation, things that wear away at one's well-being. However, there's also um, the kind of indirect, so to speak, effects that can come into effect one's mental health, even if you aren't anywhere near the front lines of uh, such direct climate impacts. And that is when we get into talking about climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, the worrying and concern that comes with understanding the immense amount of um, havoc and danger that comes with warming temperatures. And so uh, the American Psychological Association defines eco-anxiety as the chronic fear of environmental doom. And that is essentially playing into what Maddie is talking about as to why young people are feeling afraid to have kids, whether or not they are anywhere um, close to those kinds of climate disasters, but they're just thinking about the world in which those kids would have to grow up in. Maddie, do you share any of those concerns? Well, I think it's certainly real. I think people are obviously very distressed and making decisions out of that distress. Uh, my advice to, to people, not that they asked for it, would, would be to sort of live in the present, which is, of course, the premise of all ancient wisdom is that we shouldn't uh, project ourselves too far into the future for our own mental health. Uh, it's also the basis of cognitive behavioural therapy. We're not supposed to catastrophize, even if those catastrophes are possible. 
um, especially assuming the fears of of other people. So, of course, the, the climate emergency is is just that, but it it is affecting directly affecting vulnerable people and key global ecosystems. It's not really going to have as much of a day to day effect on us and our uh, and our children. That that's not a reason not to care, but it is a reason not to live in a perpetual state of panic. Brooke, do you agree with that? Do you think there is a risk that we are, in a way, focusing too much on the catastrophizing element and it is now holding young people back in terms of making plans? I think that there's a, a false element of safety there that was just articulated as though there are only certain people in the world that will be affected by the climate crisis, whereas privileged, relatively safe and secure citizens of the high income nations, first world, so to speak, um, will not be touched by its harms. That already is showing to not be true. Although, of course, it's a highly disproportionate um, system that we're living in. And of course, predominantly uh, people in low and middle income countries and and typically uh, communities of color are being hit hard and fast by the climate crisis and others are Maintaining, maintaining uh, a relative sense of safety and ability to stay out of harm's way. Maddie, you're in the United States. You know that there are heat waves and there are deadly wildfires and there are um, floods and there are all kinds of issues that are uh, affecting communities and taking lives in a, in a country that would not be considered, um, you know, in that typical basket that you were talking about, about uh, those who will be harmed. So this is accelerating. People are awake and aware and seeing that um, given the scientific perspective that the research tells us we need to look at and act in accordance with when we when we take that and then we match it with something that's very key here. And that is what governments and leaders are doing about it. Um, then it brings in the sense of hopelessness and despair or at least extreme anxiety because we see that those who are put in positions of power who are meant to protect population well-being and our health and safety are not acting in accordance with what the science is saying. And that creates this pervasive sense of moral injury and that can be uh, really the propellant for this kind of chronic sense of doom that people are contending with, right? So if our leaders were acting differently, if we saw that we were behaving responsibly like adults, paying attention to the science and then changing our systems and lifestyles, well then maybe we wouldn't have this anxiety in the way that we're seeing it today. But because that isn't happening, you have then the key effects of a chronically worsening planetary health state along with the action, which is basically no action or delayed action. And then, you know, it's quite a normal and natural response that people are feeling this freaked out about the world that they're moving towards. Maddie, what, what do you say to that? In your piece, you talk about climate alarmism as one of the things that's actually kind of whipping up these concerns. Sure. So I want to clarify, I'm not for a second suggesting that we live in a safe world. Uh, we never have lived in a safe world. We've lived in a world besieged with famine and plague and natural disaster and all sorts of human suffering and, and misery. I mean, at the very least, each one of us can expect to encounter during the course of our lives uh, profound difficulties and then, of course, death. So I, I'm not I'm not sort of saying that it's all it's all rosy uh, in this part of the world. I'm just saying a sense of perspective is helpful. I do live in the United States, and uh, we have seen here many natural disasters. But I, I would again sort of urge a sense of perspective. So you mentioned California. I was in California a couple of years ago at a hotel, and uh, half the the hotel had actually been uh, affected by by a fire at some point. They'd evacuated. Nobody had been hurt. Thank goodness. Um, and life there was carrying on more or less as normal and the people weren't sort of running around uh, with with glum looking faces they were they were getting on with the with the business of living their lives and that is all I am saying I'm saying rather than live in a, a state of anticipation of a, of a future worst case scenario it is better to get on with living our lives of course engaging with these uh, these very serious issues doing what we can I, I completely agree with you that political change is what's necessary here structural and political change, which is one of the reasons why I think that the question of having children is sort of irrelevant. Uh, population and demographics is not the main cause of this. Uh, it is in fact uh, failures on the political level and in responding to uh, the needs of the world. 
And just finally, very, very briefly from both of you, um, I wondered what is your advice, uh, your one piece of advice to you know someone watching this who genuinely looks at the environment and the planet and thinks that the climate crisis means they shouldn't have a child. Um, Britt, do you want to go first? You've written about this a little bit in your book. Yeah, and, and I very much relate to anyone who feels that way. Um, four or five years ago, I came into my own um, enormous dilemma of considering whether or not I was going to have a child when my partner and I realized we really wanted to have a child. And then, you know, as a science communicator, I was looking at climate report after climate report coming across my desk and seeing that this, this doesn't really add up, you know, a safe future in which I can ensure that my child will um, be able to, you know, move through the world in a, in a, in, at a certain level of, of security, given what everything is saying about like migration crises, water shortages, you know, the potential for civil strife that comes off the back of those kinds of um, dwindling resources, et cetera, et cetera, um, plus climate disasters. And then um, this desire of mine, and it, it created uh, a, a new type of eco anxiety within myself that I needed to try and understand. So I went out and and started researching and writing a book uh, to un to see was I crazy for thinking this way, or were there other people out there that this also resonated with? And I discovered that it was a growing phenomenon at the time. And by speaking with many climate scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists and um, uh, spiritual leaders and and all kinds of different folks, I I collected perspectives that helped. Um, bring in a more nuanced discussion around what it means to have a child in in a climate changing world even one that's becoming much more dangerous and and less secure so uh you know four years later i do have a one month old and that is something that i came to on my own for a variety of reasons not just um because of what i've learned along this journey but largely also because of thinking very seriously about what it means to put a, a kid into a climate changed future and how parenting needs to change and adjust for this reality. And, um, you know, that's my decision. And I would never advocate that others should get over their fears and then go have a child if that's what they really want. I think that they need to take it seriously, um, consider all aspects that are important to them and know that there's no right decision in this, right? There's huge pros and cons to both. There's lots of great reasons to not have children and remain child free. And there's lots of great reasons to have children. Um, it's very complex and complicated, but I would just encourage um, those of us thinking about this seriously to not shame others for their uh, struggles with this question. It's it's very painful, it's very emotional, it's very real. People are thinking very hard about what the right thing to do is and um, you know, eventually have to make a decision that they're able to live with. So, but yeah, that's that's my little story that I can share that if, if you are feeling hopeless about it at some, at some point, your perspective might change um, as it did for me. Maddie, what's your advice? Um, I would say, you know, there's more to life than avoiding suffering. Of course, suffering is part of life, but you may also encounter hope, friendship, meaning, love, all these other things that make life worthwhile and that every human person touches other people's lives in, in all sorts of ways. Also, you might be lucky enough to produce the, uh, the scientific genius who's going to get us out of this mess. So I say go for it. Maddie Britt, thanks. Kathleen Stock has faced harassment and bullying for saying gender is not more important than biological sex, particularly, she said, when it comes to law and policy. Is free speech under threat on our campuses? And if so, what should be done? I'm joined now by Matthew Goodwin from the University of Kent and Rob Ford from the University of Manchester. Thanks for joining us both. To start, is that something Kathleen Stock should have said? Matt, let's come to you first. Yes, I think she should be able to express uh, her views based on her research. I think uh, ultimately uh, one of the reasons why our universities are world leading universities um, is because of the fact that we have academics with different views who can come together and exchange those views robustly. And I also think given the wider polarization that we are experiencing in Western democracies, it's more important, I think, today than ever to ensure that our students are being exposed to the very real views and values that they're going to experience when they leave university uh, out there in the real world. So I think Kathleen has every right to express her view on campus. Rob? Yeah, uh, same same view, basically. Uh, I mean, I, I do not think any academic should be prevented 
from saying things that are perfectly legal within the framework of law that we have. Uh, I think there are cases that are more difficult where one has to balance academic free expression with, for example, equalities legislation, prevent legislation and so on. But the case that you gave is, is not one of those. So it's straightforward. She should be able to say it. She shouldn't be facing intimidation for wanting to say it. And the notion that this is something that should not be said is an illiberal one and wrong. And do you think Sussex Union has had the right response here? We know that there was a push uh, uh, by the union to ultimately call for a full investigation into transphobia. Uh, I mean, you've got to separate out the response of the university and the union because it was very different things. I mean, the university's response was to put its vice chancellor up on the Today programme to defend Kathleen Stock's, I believe the word he used was untrammeled rights, free speech. That strikes me as the right response to what was a campaign, an anonymous campaign of intimidation on campus. He was standing up for his employee and their rights. The union's response was rather disappointing. Uh, I think it would have been nice for a union, which is supposed to be about defending the rights of employees, to have made clearer uh, and stronger statement of defence. They did, however, say that intimidation is wrong. And they did also raise the point, which hasn't featured much incidentally a discussion of this incident, that the details, personal details of local union members at Sussex who had raised these objections were themselves posted on the internet by various individuals, thereby encouraging further campaigns of intimidation. And frankly, I think the union is right to raise the fact that that is also not a legitimate way to conduct this debate. Matthew, what do you think? Are we seeing a wider issue uh, when it comes to academics and um, wariness now about speaking out on certain issues? I think we are. I think in some way Kathleen was um, quite lucky in having a supportive vice chancellor, at least a vice chancellor who was willing to to go out there and make, make the case uh, in defence of academic freedom. That has not been the case at other institutions. I would note that The Spectator, among others, has pointed to the legacy of Stephen Toop at Cambridge, who would be a prime example of a vice chancellor who, at least in my view, fundamentally failed to um, protect and promote academic freedom. And we've had a number of other cases in the UK um, where vice chancellors have not proactively um, stepped into uh, these debates when they could have actually uh, done so and 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 could have could have dampened them down. I'm thinking about the treatment in particular of Neil Thin at the University of uh, Edinburgh, uh, who uh, was was sort of hauled through a very long and messy and public disciplinary process, underlining the key point in these cases, which is that um, the uh, process is the punishment for academics. So your reputation is essentially shredded um, while university. Uh, sort of uh, bows to, to, to these mobs. Um, I think uh, David Runciman at Cambridge made this point very well yesterday in, in that, you know, even Talking Politics, a, a sort of a, another podcast, uh, feels unable to go near issues uh, such as uh, uh, gender and uh, uh, trans issues because of the fear of the consequences. So we're not even talking about a small minority uh, pointing to this issue anymore. We're talking about, you know, uh, some of the most prominent academics in the country, uh, both on the left and the right, who, who I think are saying, you know, against the backdrop of the Kathleen Stock case, it's no longer credible to say that we do not have an issue with academic freedom in the United Kingdom. And I think um, that is a very uh, depressing place to be. Um, <clears throat> and it, it reminds us that we need to do something about it uh, if we're going to be able to move forward. Do you agree with that, Rob, that we now do have a widespread issue when it comes to freedom of speech on campuses? I think I would object to the word widespread. Um, I mean, I agree with much of what Matthew says. Uh, I think that we are seeing a number of actors in the debate over, the, uh, over gender, transgender, gender critical, who are behaving in a way that's deeply illiberal. Um, I think there are examples of university administrations failing to provide a sufficiently robust defence to their members in that area. But I think what uh, all of that omits is that universities have more than one set of responsibilities that they have to speak to. 
they do also have to respect equalities legislation. Now, Matthew mentions the process is the punishment. Well, yes, and that is a problem, and sometimes processes are far too long. But to take another case that has recently happened this year, which isn't on the gender issue, but on the issue of views about Israel, uh, David Miller at the University of Bristol lost his job. He faced a very long process. It is still to this day not clear on what grounds he was dismissed. Now, I would emphasise that, in my view, David Miller's views were fundamentally unacceptable because they involved threatening, disclosing the details of and threatening and stigmatising and stereotyping individual named students at his campus. But a university has to sort out the different and conflicting responsibilities it faces when you have a situation, on the one hand, of uh, protecting the rights of academics to speak freely, and on the other hand, respecting equalities legislation um, with regards to protected characteristics, which would include gender, which would include ethnicity, which would include trans status. Um, That is not necessarily a simple or easy matter to sort out. That does sometimes require lengthy procedures, which may indeed include a need to remain silent within a polarised public sphere in order not to prejudice the case as it goes through. So while I agree there clearly are issues with illiberalism on some issues, and and that illiberalism stretches well beyond the university campus, it is also the case that to think of this as an issue solely in terms of free speech is to miss the most important source of tension and conflict within this issue. Matthew? Well, I mean, just to go back to your question, I mean, I think the the evidence on um, the problem that we have with academic freedom today, uh, just before we go into specific cases, is pretty overwhelming. Uh, about two or three years ago, when a few colleagues and I started to raise this issue and started to form a working group on this issue, the I think it's fair to say there was a very loud view, you might even say dominant view, that this was being exaggerated, that this was being um, uh, perhaps used for political purposes, that essentially it didn't really exist as an issue. And we saw a number of prominent academics essentially make make that case. There was a, a strong rebuttal to some of the arguments that were made through various policy reports among a large number of academics, suggesting that this was um, being exaggerated or that we couldn't possibly make um, uh, conclusions uh, about threats to academic freedom based on what those reports were showing. I think fast forward to today, Katie, and we now have so much evidence, so much research um, that uh, I'm glad to see now today actually against the backdrop of Kathleen's case that everybody now agrees, uh, with the exception of one or two radicals who continue to argue that this is being made up, individuals such as Jonathan Portez and others. Um, I think there's a broad consensus on the left and the right that we have an issue. And and recent studies at King's, even the UCU's own survey, uh, shows that one in three academics are now self-censoring their views on campus because they fear negative consequences. Um, They fear what will happen if they do uh, air their, their real views, which David Runciman I think expressed very eloquently yesterday on Politics Live. So we do have an issue. And I would also add that as the government's higher education and academic freedom bill was passing through Parliament, which I know we'll come on to discuss, I was quite struck by the testimony from the chief executive of the Office for Students, who uh, also uh, agreed that uh, what she was seeing coming through um, her office on a regular basis pointed clearly to the need uh, for us to take uh, some action on these issues. So I, I'm, I'm less of the view, I, I, I don't share Rob's um, uh, view uh, uh, about, um, uh, about the equalities legislation. I think on some of these cases- You, you think that universities should ignore equalities legislation? No, I didn't, no, I didn't say that at all. That was what I was saying, they have a responsibility. So I, I just, I, it's important- If I could finish, if I just finish the point, just if I could finish the point. There are, there are cases such as um, Kathleen Stock's cases, uh, Neil Thin's uh, case, Noah Carl's case, I think in some respects how Jordan Peterson was treated at Cambridge, um, among others, where actually I think vice-chancellors 
uh, senior members of university actually have a moral obligation to make the symbolic and substantive point uh, that academic freedom is the primary uh, goal within higher education. And, and they can do that in some cases independently of particular cases. I was quite, quite struck by Adam Tickle's response at Sussex, you know, and I thought it was a very good response. Unfortunately, he's now stepping down as vice chancellor and we don't know what the new vice chancellor is going to say about this case. Um, but I do think we have a moral obligation as academics and as leaders of universities to make the case that actually the principle, the fundamental principle of academic freedom is one that we should protect and promote. And the reason the government has not has decided to take action in this area is because it's concluded, and I think rightly, that universities have become so ideologically skewed that they can no longer be relied upon to promote that academic freedom. Uh, and I think that's a fundamental problem. And just finally, um, I wanted to ask you both about really who carries responsibility when it comes to tackling some of the problems that you both agree there is a problem. There's obviously a disagreement as to the exact scale uh, response. And um, perhaps i start with you, Matthew, and then bring in Rob for the final word. You mentioned the government's um, you know, free speech bill, what it's doing there. And I just wondered, do you think this is something which is the government can fix or ultimately is it, are there limits to what the government can really say on this? So I think this is, um, it's a fascinating case. It's a fascinating case for global reasons as well. The UK is essentially becoming one of the first countries to, to take such positive action as in uh, uh, proactive action on academic freedom. The Canadians are watching us very closely. Uh, politicians in Quebec and France are watching this legislation very closely. Um, my view used to be, I, I think I'm right in saying similar to Rob's, but I'll let him speak for himself. I used to feel incredibly uncomfortable about the idea of government intervening in the higher education space. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've not come at this from the view that this was my, my starting position. But as I've gone through the last decade in, in higher education, and especially the five years since the vote for Brexit, and seeing the treatment of gender critical scholars, friends in history, psychology, even mathematics, who have been bullied, harassed, intimidated, um, in some cases sacked or uh, disinvited, um, I've come to the conclusion that our universities are so ideologically skewed, have become um, monocultures in some cases, that they are unable to be relied upon to protect and promote academic freedom. And, and we have lots of research that shows this. When you have very homogenous institutions, they tend to become more radical over time. Cass Sunstein and others have shown this. And I think, unfortunately, that is what's happened in our universities. And this relates also to issues around China as well, which I know that uh, The Spectator has covered uh, as well in some detail. So, so my sort of reluctant conclusion and reason for supporting the bill is that I think we need culture change within our universities. And the Higher Education Academic Freedom Bill, by appointing an external director of academic freedom, who will essentially provide oversight of issues around academic freedom, take the Kathleen Stock case. Let's imagine for a second the VC wasn't supportive of Kathleen. Let's imagine for a second that the UCU, as it, as it, as it was in this case, was not supportive of Kathleen Stock. Where, where can she go, apart from walk onto campus and be bullied and harassed. Now, she could bring a private case. She could perhaps, um, you know, contact lawyers for herself and so forth, um, but it becomes that much harder. So, so the expectation, the hope with this legislation is that it will begin to produce culture change in universities because nothing drives culture change in universities more than having things like league tables on academic freedom, uh, and the and the prospect of having negative publicity for violating academic freedom, as Sussex, I'm sure, would confirm to us uh, this week. And that is the goal here. It's not to have a totalitarian, authoritarian kind of imposition in higher education, as some of our critics have tried to make out. The goal is a simple one, which is to provide an external entity that academics who are being, uh, being persecuted for their uh, views and beliefs can turn to uh, to to, to uh, secure further support and to have that uh, organisation try and bring about wider culture change. Rob, do you uh, think the bill is a good idea? Um, largely no, and uh, not because I disagree with the idea that, you know, there are issues here that need 
at greater attention as I think has become clear from the conversation we both agree that particularly in some of the most contentious areas right now that's true I just think that if the problem is a cultural one and I actually agree that it is a cultural one um, and it stretches beyond campus that you can't just wave a magic wand with legislation written on it and you can't just wave a magic wand with regulator on it and expect that to solve the problem and I'll give a few reasons why I think that that's the case first of all the example that Matthew gives is not one that is actually extant to my knowledge in any individual case. I don't know of any university academic in Britain who has lost their job due to lawful speech. There have been cases that have been where they have faced harassment and bullying and so forth. It is not clear to me what the external regulator would actually be able to do to change that situation. Now that in itself is of course very sad but it then raises the question, well, what's the external regulator for? Even in the David Miller case, and Miller has lost his job, and we still don't know why, um, the university was clear in its statement that he has not lost his job because of lawfully expressing his views. It emphasised that his views were a lawful expression of free speech. If this regulator is about regulating the lawful expression of free speech, they're not going to have a lot to do because most of the cases that cause trouble are not about that, they're about universities' other duties, they're about their safeguarding duties, they're about their equalities legislation duties, coming into conflict in particular cases with the statements uh, and perceived reactions to those statements of people on campus. And so I, I don't think it will work for that reason, number one. Number two, and this I think is even more important, there's a jurisdictional problem here. If you actually look closely at many of the people who protest in many of these cases. I'll give you another example, the Jermaine Greer case, which incidentally in the research that Matt, Matt cited, it was treated as a case of cancellation, even though the event went ahead as confirmed by the person who organized it. Uh, it took a while to get them to correct the record on that. In the Jermaine Greer case, the people who organized the protest were not from the university. They were reported in the Daily Mail as having been students of the university, even though the leader of the protest confirmed he was not a university student and had never been a university student and neither were any of the other people involved in the protest. We do have a broader problem here with rather liberal extreme groups who are willing to engage in intimidation and disruption. And I think that that is a disgrace in the liberal society, that that is not the way that you go about making your case. However, that problem very often does not fall within the jurisdiction of universities. Universities cannot sanction people who are not students or staff on their campus. It is difficult for them to keep people off their campus. And a third problem I'd like to raise is the problem of perverse incentives. Let's say we have this external regulator and the external regulator says any university that puts on an event which is then canceled due to intimidation will face sanction. The way many university administrations which are institutionally risk averse will respond to that is to say any event where there is a risk of cancellation will just stop it from happening in the first place. If it's never announced, if it's never on the public record, then it's never cancelled. Is that a victory for free speech? I would argue, no. I would argue the situation where Jermaine Greer gets to speak at Cardiff University, even despite the protests, is the victory for free speech. Probably more people attended it because of the publicity around the protests and so forth. The situation where the vice chancellor of, of Cardiff says, oh, I don't want the regulator getting involved in this. This seems a bit like a dodgy issue where we're going to have trouble and media attention. Let's just not put it on. That's not a victory for free speech. That's the opposite. And my concern with this legislation is there's a failure to think through some of the perverse incentives that it risks creating. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Matt. And finally, who are Vladimir Putin's mistresses and why is he so desperate to hide his private life? In a piece for The Spectator website this week, Owen Matthew says the recently leaked Pandora papers perhaps give us a reason. To explain, he joins me now. Owen, you start your piece by talking about an 18-year-old's Instagram feed. Can you tell us about it? Yes, uh, this young lady, uh, who was born Elizaveta Vladimirovna Krivanogich, um, uh, appears to be, uh, or at least has been alleged last year by a Russian website, which has subsequently shut down, to nobody's surprise, that um, 
uh, this young lady is Putin's love child. Um, and uh, the allegation was repeated again by Alexander, Alexei Navalny um, in his sensational video, which has had more than 100 million YouTube views, about corruption in the Putin's, Putin's inner circle. And uh, the shocking thing, well, there's two shocking things. One, if you uh, look at the screen grabs of uh, Luisa uh, Rozova, as she calls herself, um, uh, of, uh, before she took off any kind of recognizable images of herself, she is really the spitting image of Vladimir Putin. Putin. I mean, she really is an absolute chip off the old block. But the interesting thing is not really um, Putin's personal morality. Uh, I don't think anyone in this day and age is particularly shocked by the fact that he might have a rich and powerful man might have a love child. But uh, the fact that he, uh, she and, his, and her mother have apparently, again, according to Navalny, uh, been in receipt of gigantic swathes of state money. And that appears to have been confirmed last week with the Pandora Papers, uh, which show a paper trail leading to a very swanky apartment in Monaco, just overlooking uh, the harbour, which appears to belong to uh, Luisa Rozova, uh, to, to her mother, um, Svetlana Krivanovich, Krivanogich, who uh, was Putin's mistress from the mid-90s until uh, the mid-2000s, apparently, according to the Russian website. So we have a love child, potentially, and a corruption row. Is there an outpouring of outrage in Russia over this among the public? Well, I, I guess that was really the, the main point of the story, is actually no. Um, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that uh, Putin's personal life is an absolute taboo. In fact, weirdly enough, actually, his love life is much more taboo than his financial life. I mean, obviously, the Kremlin is not very delighted about the revelations of various uh, Russian websites and of Navalny in particular about Putin's finances. But it's been really clear right from the beginning of Putin's uh, reign that he absolutely will come down like a ton of bricks on any website that reports anything about his personal life. And uh, that, I think, is one reason, is that it's not reported. It's an absolute taboo. Uh, it's almost like sort of les majesté in, in Thailand. You can't say anything bad about the king. Um, the, um, uh, and the other reason, I think, is sort of more of a cultural one, actually, is uh, Russians are not surprised. They're not shocked. Putin's behaved as they expect their leaders to behave. They don't really care. Um, either they don't believe in Navalny. Many Russians believe that uh, Navalny and people like him, uh, opposition leaders and freelance investigators and journalists are kind of somehow in the pay of foreign powers who are sort of uh, blackening the name of their beloved Putin. Um, or if they do believe it, they don't really care. And you mentioned that there appears to be a habit, and it's very striking from reading your piece, of anyone who goes near Putin's private life as a publication quite quickly has their career come to an abrupt end. Um, what do we know about Putin's private life? Um, we're talking about uh, one instance in terms of this um, supposed love child, her mother, and the wealth. Are there more mistresses? Are there legitimate children? Um, what is out there? Well, there are. Uh, he, he does have two legitimate children, although uh, so intense is his uh, uh, secretiveness about his private life, which is, of course, you know, completely f fair enough if it weren't for the fact that they were also receiving hundreds of millions of stolen stolen dollars. Uh, so, so obsessively secretive is he that, that is Putin has actually never publicly acknowledged his two legitimate children by his uh, ex-wife, Ludmila, um, and despite the fact that they, uh, you know, they're uh, sort of semi-public figures, their identities are very well known. Uh, their husbands, surprise, surprise, actually uh, have also received lucrative state contracts and head up uh, state companies and so on. But the, um, uh, the, 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 the other famous mistress is Alina Kabaeva, who was um, alleged to have been Putin's mistress uh, uh, in the late 2000s. And... Um, there were also allegations that she had a love child that much less well substantiated than the one than than the report on the, uh, on uh, the Krivanogich love child, but Alina Kabaeva was uh, again reporting of their relationship uh, was absolutely taboo, but um, and we also know nothing, know nothing about Kabaeva's finances, but we do know that she actually has uh, uh, became a member of parliament and uh, for the United Russia Party. Putin's official party, and she later, later uh, now heads a major sort of Kremlin-owned media group. 
So um, all these things, uh, um, certainly Kabayeva was a much more open secret than Krivanogi. Krivanogi, Krivanogi when that uh, story broke last November, that, that nobody really knew. But Kab- Kabayeva was uh, you know, a public figure, and uh, Putin apparently didn't really have any, any compunction about sort of promoting her publicly, although, of course, never officially acknowledging that she had any kind of romantic relationship with him, and, in fact, uh, uh, denouncing journalists who sort of stuck their snotty noses quote, unquote, uh, into his business. And we talked a bit about how little impact, really, these stories about his private life, or perhaps partly because there's a lack of stories about his private life, have on Putin's standing. I just wanted to own more generally, what is, uh, you know, the current feeling towards Putin in Russia? Um, we're hearing a lot here about Nord Stream 2, how that could strengthen his position. Um, but what is the mood? Well, he's, uh, uh, public opinion is predicated really on, on, on one baseline, and that is um, uh, on the government's ability to pay its bills. Um, of course, the crash in world oil prices since 2014 has been a major uh, headache for the Kremlin. Uh, in 2014, obviously, as we well remember, uh, Putin compensated for that and um, pushed his own personal approval ratings into the stratosphere by invading a small helpless country. I mean, that's, uh, that, that, that has been done several times in history. Um, a short victorious war does wonders for your popularity. And uh, ever since uh, that time, in the inter- intervening uh, um, seven years, there's actually been... Um, you know, everyone's been asking you know, at what point will the, the Crimea effect wear off. Um, um, Putin's party did take apparently quite a kicking in the polls in uh, uh, last month, um, although they rectified that by massaging the figures according to election observers. And uh, uh, Putin's, uh, to answer your question, Putin's ratings uh, are less than they were post Crimea, but they're still you know very enviable and they're still in the in the high sixties. But the really important thing is that actually a fairly meaningless statistic like because uh, you can ask people whether they support Putin because and many Russians will say yes because there's actually no real alternative to Putin so that's really the the, 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 the big uh, the big question um, the uh, the Putin's political stock has been held up by this very heady mixture of patriotism of um, this uh, image of himself that he projects as a national savior and paradoxically, actually, all the sanctions that have been brought in after the Crimea invasion. So we've had seven years of sanctions, um, cutting off r- Russian companies from international markets, to all kinds of economic sanctions that the Americans and the Europeans thought would punish Putin, would damage his reputation. Exactly the opposite. It's precisely the uh, sanctions have worked, but in the absolutely 180 degree converse way to that which they were intended, because what they did is they created Putin as a sort of, uh, not exactly a martyr, but a defender of the motherland against foreigners that are trying to attack us. So actually, uh, strangely enough, despite the fact that there have been very low oil prices, obviously they're coming back up again, which is good news, quids in, rubles in for Putin and his team. But um, he's actually, uh, his, his position remains actually very, very strong, um, thanks to his control of the media and his very rigorous uh, 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 you know, message discipline, um, casting himself as being sort of almost above everyday politics. So all of the flack from day to day discontent is caught by the party united russia but putin has sort of elevated himself into a sort of position of a kind of modern czar owen thank you for joining spectator tv that's it for this week if you enjoyed this episode don't forget to subscribe to the spectator's youtube channel so you never miss an episode just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon thanks for watching and do join us again next week 